In our work with beams, we usually try to locate the neutral axis as a starting point, and then we have a number of different types of loads that can be applied to the beam. We could have an axial load P, which would put the beam into compression or possibly tension. We could have a torque acting on a member, which would put the fibers in shear. We could have a bending moment that's being applied to the beam putting the uppermost fibers in compression and the lower fibers into tension. And we could have shearing forces throughout the beam that are being developed by the loads that are on the beam. So there's quite a few different forces and loads that could be applied to a beam. And then we start to look at the effects inside the fibers of the beam. And if we look at a small element in the beam, at the top we could see that that might be in compression. We had a small element at the bottom that potentially might be in tension. And if we had an element in the middle, we could have a combination of these different types of stresses and shearing stresses acting on them. So it's common to take these small rectangular elements and analyze the forces that act on them. Let's take a look at one of these elements in detail. We're inside the element. We'll call this the X face. We'll call the top the Y face. That will make this the negative X face. And this would be the negative Y face. And we can have different stresses that are acting on this. We're here on the X face. Let's say we have a stress. I'll call it stress one. And this element has to be in equilibrium, just like all parts of the structure would have to be in equilibrium. So some of the forces in the X would have to be zero here. So if we push on the X face with a compressive stress, we'd have to have an equal and opposite compressive stress on the other face, the negative X face. So we'd find that there was a stress one here as well. If we look in the Y direction, let's give this Y face a positive tensile stress, we'll call that two by summing the forces in the y has to be equal to zero, we can see that there would have to be an equal but opposite stress two on the other face. And there's a way of naming these so we know which stress we're talking about. So stress one here would be stress x, and it would be positive or negative, and the sign associated with it is based on the face that it's on and the direction. So this is on the positive X face and it's in the negative X direction. So that would be a negative stress X. Over here on this face, we are on the negative X face, but it acts in the positive X direction. So we would identify this as negative stress X as well. So it works for both faces here. On the Y face, we'd have stress Y, and it's on the positive face in the positive Y direction, so that would be a positive value. And on the negative Y face, in the negative Y direction, so negative times negative would be positive. And these cancel like uh, multiplications, basically. And it's a shorthand way of keeping track of these values. Now let's look at the shearing stresses that could act on these faces. And when we write out shearing stress, we write it by the face that it acts on and then by the direction. So that would be on the Y face and it would be in the X direction. And that would be a positive tau Y X. And if we think about it from a sum of the forces in the X has to equal zero, this element has to be in equilibrium, we would need to have an equal but opposite tau on this face down here. And this will be the negative Y face, and it's in the negative X direction. And think of it like negatives times a negative is a positive. That would be a positive shear stress on this face. So they would be equal and opposite. Now, interestingly, these two create a couple. So there's a moment generated by them. There's two forces that are equal and opposite, a distance d apart, 
and we know that those create a couple. And we can't have a couple because the sum of the moments also has to be zero on this element. So we'll find that on the x faces, we would have to have a tau x, y. And again, summing the forces vertically, there'd need to be a tau x, y. And in order for the couple to be canceled, we'd find that tau x, y has to equal tau y, x. That's a very important rule, the complementary property of shear, which tells us that if we have a shear value on one face, we'll have the same magnitude on all of the other faces in order for it to be in equilibrium. All we need is one of these values to know all four. And an easy way to remember this is they will always be tip to tip or tail to tail when we set this up. If the shears were in the other direction, they would line up tip to tip and then tail to tail in the other direction. And then notation wise, we're on the negative X face and it points in the negative Y value. Note that that comes out to be a positive shear. So these would all be positive and they'd all have the same magnitude by the complementary property of shear. Let's take a look at an example. If we're given a tau xy shear stress of 36 ksi, a normal stress in the x direction of positive 50, and a normal stress on the y face of negative 30, fill in the state of stress for this element. And I'll start with the x first. It's positive, which tells us it's in this direction. And equal and opposite. And the y direction, it would be negative. The direction is implied by the arrows that it's compressive. So that would be 30. And on the x face, I have a positive y. So we can show that here as 36. And from there, we know all the other four faces. 36. That gives us the total state of stress on this element. We've got tension in the x direction pulling it apart. We have some compression in the y direction and we have a shearing stress which is trying to elongate this thing. They're trying to distort it into a parallelogram. Now this could be written out as a matrix where this would be our x and our y, our x and our y's, and we'd have on the x face 50, and that's positive, we just leave it like that. This will be 36, be the x, y value. On the y, y face, that would be negative 30. And by the complementary property of shear, all the off main diagonals will be the same. So this will be 36 as well. And if we were given this, called the stress tensor or matrix, uh, right away we know that that would be our stress in the x, this will be our stress in the y, and this will be our tau xy value, and from there we could go right to this element and draw it. So an alternate way to see these presented, if not just listed out like that. And if it were three dimensions, where we're bringing in the z values that could be in play, this, this would then grow and become a three by three matrix, which would then list stress in the z direction, along with your tau x, z, and your tau y, z values. Now, as an engineering designer, we're often designing things for the maximum tensile stress, or the maximum compressive stress, or the maximum shearing stress. We need to know the peaks of these values so that we can design accordingly. And how do we know that the peak values are going to occur when our XY frame is aligned like this. We're looking inside of a beam and who's to say that the XY that we arbitrarily choose represents the maximum and the minimum values? What if we rotate this axis slightly and we look at other configurations that we might see? If we rotate the element arbitrarily, let's say by 30 degrees, how do we take our original XY data and convert it into the new state of stress on the different faces, where this is still an x face, so then now we could call it x prime. 
and that would still be our y prime face. How do we figure out what's going on here? We had a tensile stress in the x direction of 50, and we had a compressive stress of 30 here. As we turn the face, these two are starting to mix together, so we'll be someplace in between there. However, the shearing stresses that we had are also starting to turn into normal stresses when they reach this point. So a stress that we had here, which would be a tau, there's a component of it now that has become a normal stress and a different component here that would be the new shearing stress. So every one of these would need to have their components broken down and addressed. And luckily there's a straightforward way of doing that called Moore's circle. And Moore's circle is a fantastic way of graphically computing all of these alternate stresses occur on the different faces as we rotate the element by some angle. Let's go through the steps to create Moore's circle. Let's say we're given that the shear stress is negative 200 KSI on the XY face. The stress in the X direction is 500 KSI and this, the normal stress in the Y direction is negative 100. Step one, we need to find stress average, we call it, which will be stress X plus stress Y on two. So we're just averaging these two numbers. So that will be 500 plus a negative 100 over 2, which will give us 400 over 2, or 200 KSI. And that's important because that becomes the center of our circle. So now let's lay out the circle. We have all the information that we need to do that. Here we'll set up a, an XY axis frame. And on the X axis, we're going to plot stress x and normal stress y. And on the vertical axis, we're going to plot the shearing stresses where we'll have clockwise on top and counterclockwise stresses on the bottom. So it pays to make these roughly to scale. So I'll call these 100 increments here and the same here. And let's pin the center of our circle first. So that'll be at 200. So that's stress average, which is 200 in this case. So now we know the center point. And let's pin the X end of the circle, which will be called the rotator. And we can pin the rotator with these values. So stress X is 500, so we'll go three more. That'll be here. That's 500, and that's the stress in the X. And we have negative 200 on the XY face. Now let's look at that for a second. On the X face, it's negative, which tells us it's down. And that would be a clockwise rotation. So for the X face we have, if we come up 200, here, there's our 200, and that locates the X end of the rotator, which we can now drop down to here, and that will be R, our rotator value, which is also the radius of our circle. And if we look at that, if we're told the location of this X end of the rotator, we can read down, and that gives us the stress value of 500, and we can read back to the y-axis, and we find that we have 200 on the x face that would be pushing it in the clockwise direction. Now let's try to pin the y of the rotator. Uh, y, we go back to negative 100. If we again look at our element, we found that on the x face it was negative. That's tau x, y. So on the y face, it has to be tail to tail here. Tau y, x will be counterclockwise on the y, where that was clockwise when it was on the x. So we come down 200 counterclockwise. And where these two meet, that will be the y end of our rotator. And we can connect that, and you'll notice that that becomes a straight line. 
and that will have the same magnitude as the other side of that circle. And now we have the basics of our circle. If we rotate this around, it'll form a circle of radius r with a center at the average normal stress value. Now there's something very important to observe here. The x end and the y end of the rotator are 180 degrees apart, when in the real world, the x and y are 90 degrees apart. So everything we read off of Moore's circle will be double the angle of what it is in the real world outside. Moore's circle is just a calculator that lets us compute the values for stress. And we have to be aware that all angles on here are double the real world. From here, we want to make a right triangle out of this. Where well, we know these legs, this is 200. And this leg down here is 300. And right here is our 2 theta that we've got. So R would be the square root of 300 squared plus 200 squared. And 2 theta will be tan to the minus 1 of the opposite 200 over the adjacent leg 300. So by pinning the center of the circle and the end of the X rotator, we can generate this triangle, which very quickly feeds us these important values. So from here, we'll get that this is 360 KSI. And this will be 33.7 degrees read from our Moore circle, which means in the real world, theta P will be 33.7 divided by 2, which is 16.8 degrees. So right now, the location of the rotator indicates the current state of stress that was given over here and the data set that we had. And with that, we're able to construct more circle. Now, the way we can use it as a calculator is the following. Well, here we have an element with this current state of stress on it. We have 500 in this direction. We have 100 in this direction. And we have a shearing stress that looks like that on all four faces. And the question is, what will happen if we rotate this element inside the beam? We're not rotating the beam, but just the element. So if we rotate the element, how will all of these change? And that computation can be done with Moore's circle. For example, let's say we'd like to rotate this by 45 degrees. In the real world, that's a 90 degree rotation on Moore's circle. So from here, I will rotate this out to 90 degrees. And that will now be the X prime, we'll call it, the rotated one. So here, this is 360 KSI. And we've rotated it 90 degrees from its original location. So this angle down here will be 56.3. And we can read our distance away from the center by taking the sine and the cosine of the 56.3. And if we do that, we'll find that 56.3 cosine times 360 is exactly 200. So it turns out our, our rotator end here, x, has landed right on this axis, which then gives us a stress x prime at this new location, 45 degrees, of 0 KSI. And then the height here we could get by doing 360 sine of 56.3, which works out to be 300. We can see it pinned it right here. So tau xy will now be negative 300. And on the x face, clockwise is negative. That's how we get that. And now to get the y value, that's the other end of the rotator. It'll be down here someplace. And... That'll be the y end of the rotator. That'll read off our y values. Now r and the angle of 56.3 are the same on this end too. So this is going to be 200. And this will be 300 as well. And what we find then 
is that the new value for y, stress y, will be 200 at the center plus this 200 here, which will be 400. And now it's positive. Now something else that we can do with more circle is we can find the maximum stress. And that's very important in design. And if we look up here, we could rotate our rotator down so that the x end is sitting right here and it'll read off the peak value and we can see that it'll be the average stress plus r at that point so stress max will be stress average plus r which in this case will be 200 the average plus 360 we'll get 560 ksi's of maximum tensile stress. And it would occur when the element is rotated downwards by half of the 33.7, which will be 16.8 degrees. We will see a 560 KSI tensile stress on that face now. Um, and we would design for that. Now along with that would come the shear values, and we know that the shear is read off the vertical axis, and the tau would be zero. So there'd be no shearing stresses. And on the Y face, we'd be over here at this end of the rotator, which would be stress average minus R. So this will also give us the other end of it, where 200 minus 360 will be negative 160. And negative is compressive. So with that, we can very quickly read off the maximum values, which are called the principal stresses. And those are the ones that we use for design. Let's try one from scratch. This is all in MPAs. We have 150 in tension on the X face. We have 50 in tension on the Y face and a shear on all faces of 50 MPAs. And notice that they're all tip to tip or tail to tail. So that's appropriate. Draw out more circle and compute the maximum principal stress for this element. All right, so step one, let's list out what we've got here. In the x direction, we have 150. Stress y is positive 50. The average then will be 200 on 2, which is 100, also positive. And then tau xy is 50 and we observe that it's counterclockwise and with that that's the center of our circle here and with that we can draw out our circle the x-axis will have the normal stresses on it the y-axis will have the shearing stresses and this will be clockwise and this will be counterclockwise on a given face I want to do this roughly to scale so I'll make this 50 100 150 200 and the same going vertically. Just a rough approximation here. So the center of our circle is at 100, which will be here. Put a big dot for that. And we pin the X end of the rotator at 150. So that's here. And that tells me that the X end of the rotator would be someplace on this line. And it's pinned by the tau, the shear value here, which is counterclockwise. So here we are at 50. And that's where the X end of the rotator is located. And there is our R value. And if we look in here, 100 minus 150, that's going to be 50 in here. And this is also 50, which then gives us R as the square root of 50 squared plus 50 squared or 50 square root of 2. So R is 70.7 MPA. And theta in here, which is 2 theta in the real world, so 2 theta is going to be tan of 50 over 50 or 45 degrees. And in the real world, we'll rotate it theta P, we call it principal uh, angle of 22.5 degrees and we rotate the element in the counterclockwise direction to get to the max. So that tells us if we rotate this up, the X face of the element will have this peak stress on it. So stress max 
the stress average plus R, which is 100 plus 70.7. So we get a principal stress of 171 MPA, which would be our design stress. And a minimum, we could also calculate that, stress minimum would be 100 minus 70.7. .7. So the stress minimum will still be positive and it'll be around 30 MPA. This becomes our design tension stress value. Now tau max, we can also find to test our element in shear stress. And that would occur if we rotate it to here where the rotator would now be vertical. So we'd have to rotate it clockwise by 22.5 in the real world. And at that point, we can see that tau max will equal R, which will be 70.7. .7. So that would be the maximum shearing stress that we would work from. And this would be the maximum compressive stress that we work from. And notice that we didn't really need to draw all of Moore's circle. We really need to just pin the rotator at R here and then figure out what the values are. So the rest of the circle um, we don't really need. And the, the Y end of it is doing the opposite here. And we could fill it in and make it a circle to see. And if we were asked to rotate it by some very specific angle, we could do that too and then read off the values as well. But generally this first half here is enough. We usually want the maximum values and that's enough to move on to design. Another common use for Moore's circle in solid mechanics is to compute the maximum and minimum moments of inertia for shapes, particularly when we're designing a column. So if we have a triangle here, and it's going to be a column, and let's say that we've got three inches by three inches in cross section. First, we'd like to identify the neutral axis, which we know for triangles, will be at the two-thirds, one-third line. So that'll be X bar and Y bar. And from here, we can calculate the IX for a triangle in this orientation is 136th VH cubed. The IY is 136th HB cubed. And these are about the centroid and they're symmetric in that design. And the product of inertia IXY is 1 over 72. And for this configuration, that'd be negative B squared H squared. And we can compute all these. In this case, B equals H. So we'll get 3 to the fourth on 36, which would be 2.25, all in inches to the fourth. And with that, we have our primary values for the inertia about the x-axis, the inertia about the y-axis, and the product of inertia. The product is a combination of x and y. And this negative is interesting. The product of inertia is defined as the integral of x, y, dA. And an integral is like a summation. So for every dA that we have over here has some x and a y value, there'd be another dA over here that also has an x and a y. And interestingly here, with a negative x and a negative y associated with these, all these contributions would be positive and these would be positive. For area in this regime, we have a negative x but a positive y. So this product in here will be negative and this will be negative. And you can see it when you look at this triangle, the negative areas are dominating over the positive areas. The positives are closer to the axis and the negatives are further away. And that's why that's coming out to be negative. If we turn the triangle around, we would get a positive inertia from that because now the positives would be dominating. So just a little bit of an insight as to why that negative is there with the product. There's a handy rule of thumb here, and that is that the moment of inertia of an area will always be the lowest when it's on a centroidal axis. However, that alone 
doesn't mean that it's the lowest possible value of all. So for now, we're looking for ix's, and there's a whole family of ix's that we could calculate depending on where we locate the x-axis. And that rule tells us that the absolute lowest ix will be here. However, it doesn't address the fact that we could also then rotate it to make that slightly lower or higher. And that's where more circle comes in. Now to complete more circle for this, we need I average. And interestingly here, I average will be 2.25, 2.25 plus 2.25 on two. So that's an interesting configuration and that's due to the symmetry. So let's draw out an axis. When we're plotting inertias, the x-axis will have the moments of inertia ix and iy, and the vertical axis will contain your products of inertia, and the positives will be here, and the negatives will be down here. We'll start by plotting the center of the circle, which will be at 2.25 here. And that tells us, interestingly, that the x and the y are the same. So for this one instant, the rotator has to be vertical. And we're going to use the ixy to pin it. And that's half of 2.25, so that'll be about here, negative 1.125. And where these two intersect is where the x end of the rotator is. And then if we extend this up, the y end of the rotator is out here. And in this case, it's easy for far r. The magnitude of the rotator is, is 1.125, the value of the product. And I think you can see that if we rotate this up, by 90 degrees, we'll find I max as I max will be I average plus R. So we'll get from that 2.25 plus 1.125. So I max will be 3.375. Inches to the fourth. And then I minimum will be minus R, where we would have the y axis dropping down to here. So it'll be average plus R and then average minus R to find that. So in that case, when we do a minus, we get an I minimum of 1.125 inches to the fourth. And it tells us what that would occur when we rotate the x axis by 90 degrees on Morse circle, which means in the real world, it's half of that, it'll be 45 degrees. So up here, if we rotate the x-axis up to 45 degrees, this will be our x prime, our xp axis. And I think you can see that we've got a lot of material, a lot of area far away from that axis, and we would expect that that would be an I max axis. And then perpendicular to that, we have our Y P axis. And notice here how the area is all very close to the axis, which minimizes the I value. So this turns out to be the minimum, and the minimum axis is the axis for buckling, particularly that we'd be concerned with. So if we loaded up this triangular column, this would be the axis where we'd anticipate this to buckle, and this would be the I value that we would use in our calculation for P critical when we do that. So for non-symmetric axes, you have to compute the principal moments of inertia to determine what the true minimum is for free buckling to occur. So being on the centroidal axis alone is not enough, particularly if it's not symmetric. Um, you can see that this axis does not an axis of symmetry, and neither is the vertical axis. However, once we rotate it, this axis is an axis of symmetry, and that's an indicator that that's going to be a principal axis for us. And the Mohr circle would let us very quickly calculate the value. Very common application of Mohr circle. In summary, Mohr circle is really amazing. We can use it to compute the inertia of an object. The center is always the average of the two values. And then we pin the X and the Y rotators by the product of inertia. 
And keep in mind that everything in here is 2 theta. It's a double the angle of the real world. We could also plot stress here. So on this axis, we'd have stress x or y. And here we have tau clockwise and tau counterclockwise are shear stress values. And then stress average would be here. And we can compute R, same process. And you could even do this for strain, where the x axis would be the strain in the x or y direction. And the y axis would be one half of the shearing strain. And this would be clockwise up here. And then same down here, one half of the shearing strain. This would be counterclockwise down here. And same process. And you could calculate the strain along different rotated angles through a section. So more circle is easy to master and extremely useful for computing values on a rotated axis frame. Thanks for watching.